Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Well, again, I want to welcome you, those that are here today. We are in a study of the book of 1 Thessalonians, and for Christians, you hear that, and that's real cool. But for those of you that are at the very beginning of your journey with God, you hear a book. I thought the Bible is a book. Well, there's 66 books, and the book we're studying is nothing more than a love letter from God written by a man named Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit to a group of people just like you here, except they're in another part of the world 2,000 years ago. But let me remind you that the truths that he wrote then are not dusty old dry truths, but they're very much for us today. And so I want to speak to those truths. So this week and the next time I'm with you, which will be in two weeks because Will is going to give the message next week, I want to talk about the second coming of Christ. And I want to talk a little about the foundations that we have and what's the right foundation as we look into the future. Because when you hear the term second coming of Christ, you automatically think, well, I know he came the first time, that's Christmas, and I know he died and rose again, that's uh, Easter, but what's this whole thing about the coming of him again in the future? And so we have to be prepared for the future. But to be properly prepared for the future, we have to lay the right foundations today as we get ready for the future. And I got asking myself, what are some of the right foundations that we should lay for ourselves to prepare for the future? So is it going to be maybe perhaps on something as important as uh, pride. Now, you wouldn't like that word pride, but there are a lot of people today that say the best way to prepare for tomorrow is to do everything I can to be and to do so that I can have a better future for tomorrow. And so whatever the mind can conceive that I can achieve, and there's a lot of that psycho-cybernetics that are out there, a lot of it's taught like that, especially in the different isms and spasms that are there. And not necessarily that is bad, but when you put your entire future on you and yourself, is that the best foundation upon which to build, which centers around pride? I think you'd be honest to say, "Mm, it's important to do that, but it's not pride. It's not the right foundation. It's a shaky foundation. And then there are others that say, well, maybe it's not just doing and being, but it's also maybe having that compelling urge to have. If I have everything in order for my future, then my future will be better than it is today. And so there are a lot of people at the stage of their career where that they're just using up all of their health to get the wealth so that when they retire, they have something to enjoy. Now, in a sense, that's not bad. The Bible does talk about investing and preparing for the future. But when you use up your life today, building on the foundation of materialism, that's not healthy. And a lot of times this health that we're giving up is not only our physical and emotional health, but it'll be also our relational health with families. And many of you know broken families today because they have just in, invested so much in the materialism preparing for the future. And then you have the other one where basically they say, you know, as I open up the newspaper, I'm hearing nothing but problems in this world. So there probably won't be a future for the next year or so. How many of you have been following the saga that's going into Egypt? We have one of our missionaries that goes into Egypt twice, sometimes three times a year. And he's invited Carol and me last week or so to go to Egypt in October. I'm having a hard time getting Carol to go with me on the plane, but... um, But you hear all of that, and those are real people, and there's real Christians in that. And then you hear about how it's happened in New Mexico with the drug cartels and all that they're doing. And here's a missionary and his wife, a sweet couple, been there 40 years, helping those people only to have some robbers in the cartel to kill his wife while they're driving just to steal the pickup truck just south of the Texas border. So when you read stuff like this, you're saying, what does the future hold for us? I might as well just deny the future, live for today, because there won't be any future. To me, that reminds me of an ostrich that will put its head in the sand. You've seen those proverbial pictures. The only problem is they're in a very vulnerable situation where along comes life. And then you have the others that they're so fearful of the future that what they do is they want to prepare for it by abandoning life here, accumulating as much water and food and guns and hide up in some country, preparing for the worst to come so they can fight it all out. Now, in some of all of this, there is that right to be prepared. But what is the right, I guess, foundation upon which to build our life as we look to the future? And I'm going to put it in a four-letter word. It's in hope. It's on the word hope. Now, for us in our English language, when we hear the word hope, we often think, well, I hope, I hope, I hope, you know. It's kind of like another word for the word wish. I wish, I wish, I wish. 
But for Christians, when we use the word hope, it's like now we have something upon which we can rely. It's confidence that we have. It's an anticipation with joy that it's going to happen. That's our hope. But the world has more of a wish that goes on. I could, for a moment there, for only a brief moment, though, in my mind, I was thinking about what it was like to be one of the Chilean miners deep below the surface of the earth, not knowing how much air or water or food or life you can have, waiting hopefully to be able to be rescued. And frankly, even the best minds that the world had to be able to bring in the very best and brightest equipment to help get them. Those miners still only had a wish because there was no absolute 100% guarantee that any one of them or all of them would be rescued. But that wish turned into reality when, they, when the last man popped out of the rescue capsule and the whole world cheered. And there was a part of the world in me being one who cried with joy when I saw that. But the hope wasn't realized because it only happened when the guys arrived on solid ground and they could breathe life. And even with those men, as much as we celebrate the victory and those that did it and the joy that they have, those men will die. Now there's good news. The gospel was given. Most of those men, maybe all of them, even came to faith as the records are now being known. So they have a better hope than even on planet Earth. It's the hope for the future. But again, what do you build your future on? You build it on real hope, something that's going to happen. But watch this now. That hope has to be built on something. And what the hope is built on is what is known as truth. And that goes all the way back. What is the truth? Something that is true that I can build my hope on. That old hymn that a lot of our senior saints love to sing that we probably should sing occasionally too is, my hope is built on what, everyone? Nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. You see, when you throw righteousness into that song about Jesus Christ, then you're all wrapping up Christ around his character. And he said, I am the way, the truth. And so hope that's built on truth is hope that's built on Christ. But that's the living part of Christ. But you also have the written truth that's right here. So my hope is built on nothing less than God's word. So this is the written Christ as we have the living Christ. And that's the truth upon which we build. Now, in a few moments here, I'm going to begin to unpack a study on the second coming of Christ. And here I've got 20 minutes, maybe 30, and maybe longer if some of you will stay, or all afternoon for my wife who will stay. Uh, joking aside, this is an incredible subject that could take us months to go through, especially if I want to dangle in front of you all the different sub-beliefs about the second coming of Christ. When does he come? Before the, the tribulation, during the tribulation, at the front part of the tribulation, after the tribulation, or he's already been here and left and all of that. But I don't have time to do it. But I will tell you as your pastor, as long as the Lord gives me a breath and a mind and leaves me here with you, I will be here to help you go through this study because our hope is built on Jesus Christ and Him and who He is and to know that He's coming back. How many of you are looking for the Lord to come back? I know I am and I sure hope He comes today. Now some of you, I know we've got a lady in here that's going to be married next Saturday and I know she's saying, let him come Sunday, you know, just maybe next Sunday, you know, I want to get this thing here done. But let's answer some questions here about the Lord coming back. The first one is, when is it going to happen? Oddly enough, while I was doing the research for this sermon, coming into my email box in the industry of preachers, they give you a lot of information. And there is an old guy, I won't even mention his name, but about 30 years ago, he was setting one date after another date, and he had to keep moving his dates. All of a sudden now, it's hit the airwaves again. He has set another date of when he's going to happen. When is the Lord going to return? While I'm doing the study in the same week, I get a three-page letter from somebody, maybe in Vermont, maybe Virginia, all right, that was now also wanting me to be warned because there's a date when Jesus Christ is going to come back. And if you'd like to know that date for $100, I'll tell you that date. I'll take the $100 first, but I'll guarantee he's not going to tell you when he's going to come back. So when is all this stuff going to happen? So what I'm hoping to do now is I would like to give you some answers to that by this little four-point little outline. Now, again, for those of you that are the, uh, the theologians in our group, and like we heard last week, a testimony from one of our new deacons that this is one of the most mature churches that he's been a part of. And, and I have to tell you that I am blessed to have a spiritually mature church. You're going to sit back and say, boy, pastor, that was so shallow. I already knew all of that stuff. That was, that, that, that was good for the other people, but not for me. I'm going to ask you to go on this journey with me anyway. And I want you to go on the journey on the front seat of this car in the weeks to come. 
There are a lot of reasons why you folks that are big into this should go on this journey. Not to correct you at all. In fact, I don't think I'll do anything but maybe just reinforce you some old truths that you have. But I want you to go back to those thrilling days of yesteryear in your mind. Do you remember where you were when you first heard correctly about the second coming of Christ? I remember where I was. I was a lost goonie surfer in November. I trusted Christ as my Savior. Carol led me to Christ. You know the story. Most of you know that. In December, Carol says, how would you like to go to a Christian wedding? I've never been to a Christian wedding. I'm just a brand new Christian. I said, sure. She says, well, why don't you come with me? So the same girlfriend of hers that took both of us to this meeting, we're now at the wedding. The place was packed because it was the pastor's daughter. As I'm walking down the aisle, Carol is leading the way, which is uncharacteristic for her, but she wanted to find us a seat. So while she's in front... I'm in the middle, and her girlfriend is behind me, and I'm in this church pretty much for the very, very first time, going to a Christian wedding, a pastor's daughter, and her name was Mary Jane. Never forgot that name. Married a guy named Wally. And so as I'm going down the aisle, her girlfriend is one of those real bubbly, you ever meet people like that, real bubbly? Oh, I'm so excited. This is a wedding. This reminds me of Jesus, who's the groom, who's going to come back and marry the bride. He's going to come for us. He's going to take us all off the earth. We're going to be with him, forever married with him. And I'm hearing this, and remember, no Bible. We didn't even say grace. I thought all the books in the Bible were in alphabetical order. You know, how in the world? Who is... And I'm hearing this. And so now I'm seated. Now, again, I am curious so we're seated there the wedding is you know getting started and it's one of those real quiet and all this and and i'm leaning over to her friend lindy and i said what now what's that oh yeah he's gonna come after he comes there's gonna be a horrible war and the, there's gonna be blood there's gonna be this and i'm saying what what are you saying lady and carol her personality is that phlegmatic calm and she's going shh this is the wedding shh would you quiet down shh now, I can go back and say that's the very first time I heard about Christ coming back. But I am no less excited about it now than I was then. Because I know what that deep truth really meant to me then. So you might know that. Those of you that are maybe on so far on the front end, this second coming of Christ is so new to you. So I kind of compartmentalize this. There are those of you that are going to hear this for the first time. Maybe those of you that are going to listen to me on radio or download it off our website, this message. And this is all new to you. Do not feel guilty that you do not know this. Don't sit back there now, fan. They know everything. Man, I should have known all this, man. How am I be so stupid? You're not stupid. Truth is something that builds upon. And you're getting it now. The second group are those that heard it incorrectly. You're saying, yeah, I know the Lord's supposed to come back. In fact, I saw him on Waikiki with a white short and long beard and he had a sign. And so that's what you think Christ is. Now, I don't want to make that ludicrous, but there are people that believe all that stuff and it's wrong. And so we need to go back to our hope is truth. And then there are some of you that are saying, I am desperately interested in this. So please be with us. Lean into this. Ask the questions. Get the books. We have a class for the men called the Foundations of the Christian Faith. And we'll be going into this much more in detail called eschatology. Now, there's a mouthful. Eschatology, the doctrine of last things. You need to know this. And it's not that hard. And you might say, well, I, I've got a problem with my marriage. And my finances are, 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 are empty. And my kid didn't come home last night. And you're going to talk about Christ coming back? I just want to make sure. I wonder, how, how will I make it till tomorrow morning? I, I, know, I know your pain. I realize that. And I do not want to at all minimize that. But believe it or not, the whole issue of you knowing about Christ's coming still can address the emotional needs to prepare you for whatever the future might hold with your finances or fitness or family or friends or foe or whatever else you have in your life. So it does relate to our practical even here and now. So let's look at it. First of all, what will happen? We're going to call it the return of Christ. He is going to come back again. This is when the Lord will descend. Now, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to look at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You can also look at it on the screen. You can also look at it on the worship uh, folder or outline you have for you. But let's follow along very quickly here. And here's what he says. Verse 13, Paul writing to a group of people just like you and me. He says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, when I read that phrase, do not be ignorant, for those of you that want more Bible here, do you know that Paul uses that phrase, I don't want you to be ignorant, I don't want you to be ignorant, I don't want you to be ignorant, about five different topics in the Bible. One of them is spiritual gifts. The other one is the second coming of Christ in essence of what happens to those people who die. So what he's really saying is, hey guys, lean into this intellectually, 
you need to know this truth. It is important for you. Don't be ignorant in it. What I find so fascinating is this group that he's writing to, he was only with them a few months. He had already taught them, and now he's kind of reminding them of what he already taught because questions began to pop up. Now, by reading through the rest of this context, which I will in a moment, I want you to know that it's coming off of probably some similar questions that you have, or maybe some of your family have asked you. Questions such as, um, where do I go when I die? And uh, when my family dies who doesn't know Christ, what happens to them? And those who know Christ, but they've died, where did they go? And will I meet them in heaven? Will I see them? And uh, when is this all going to happen? And I hear about Christ coming back. How does he come back? And well, why does he come back? They're asking all the same questions that you're asking that I would ask. Now, I have to be very frank with you. We probably will have more questions about this topic in so many ways, more than we even have per question per person in this group, than even the Bible will have an answer for specifically. Now, don't grab your nitroglycerin tablet. <clears throat> My heart stopped. You really mean that? That's right. Because there will be some questions that I cannot answer, thus saith the Lord. But I can tell you this, the questions that need to be answered are all answered accurately and clearly in Scripture. The ones that are not don't mean a whole lot whether we know that. And if you park on the skepticism of what you don't know to cancel out what you do know or could know, you'll ruin your relationship with the Lord because you'll just chase all these little bunny rabbits all around that really ultimately don't mean that much. And the good news is I don't have to have God answer all my questions this side. Otherwise, he would be the wisest man that ever lived. And God is not the wisest man who ever lived. He's wisest. He is wisdom. So he's beyond the wisest, wisest. And so he has stuff that he knows and he's chosen to hold them back and reveal them to me, maybe in bite sizes. I'll learn more. And there'll be some stuff he says, I'm going to hold back until you get to heaven, Stan. So I might not be able to answer all your questions today. But he says, don't be ignorant of what I can give you. You see the word asleep there in your Bible? Now, some Bibles are smart enough now. They've translated it where they don't say asleep. But that's a common word because when you looked at someone who died, what does a person look like when they're dead besides white and pasty and all that? What do they look like, everybody? Like they're sleeping. I remember the first funeral I went to as a young boy, younger than any of the kids that are in here that are in our, our other group. I remember I was precocious. I know it's hard for you to believe. You probably thought I was very quiet and obedient and submissive to my mom and dad. Uh, but I was pretty precocious. And I went to a funeral. I remember it was my uncle later that died. I remember sitting there. There's lights like here. And of course, they have the casket here. And it's opened up. And there's this man who was my uncle laying down there. And everybody's calling and, you know, talking in hushed tones. And I very much wanted to know. And I said, Mom, that man's sleeping up there. And all these people are talking. And they're going to wake that guy up. Now, it was sad because half the group was going, oh, no, the other half was laughing. They looked like they're asleep, but in the context here, they were dead, D-E-A-D, they were dead. And so don't let that word throw you. So we're talking about people who passed away. Verse 14, he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's really the gospel, it's the death and the resurrection, the other stuff proves that he died and he rose again, but the real gospel is the death and resurrection. And by the way, how many of you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Would you raise your hand? Great. A lot, of, a lot of unsaved people believe that. But how many of you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ who died and rose again? Now raise your hand. Okay, that's what he's really referring here. Not just do you know this happened as a historical event. Do you believe it's truth and it's truth for you because you trusted him? It says, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So let's begin to look at our little outline here. For those of you that want to kind of fill some of this stuff in and what does it really mean. So we have the return of Christ. That means the Lord is going to descend. This whole concept about Christ coming back, for those of you that are real new to your Bibles, I hope you got a new Bible for Christmas. And if you didn't get a new Bible, get a Bible. Get a study Bible. Get a Bible that's got leather on this thing. I, I know I've got a Bible too in my iPhone. And I, Mac, I've probably got 100 Bibles in my iPhone if you know what I'm trying to say. But get a Bible you can touch and feel and hold and mark and carry with you. And frankly, go public with. The iPhone stuff, people only if they're looking over your shoulder might know that it's it. Go public with it. But that's my personal opinion. But going back to this right here, how important this is about prophecy. Listen to the statistics I found when I did the homework on this. I found that there are over 1,845 references on Jesus. Listen, listen. Second coming. 
Not the first coming, but the second coming. And that's just in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I find that there are 260 chapters with 316 references, meaning that there is about one prophecy of the second coming of Christ for every chapter in the New Testament. And technically, there is one prophecy of Christ coming back again for every 30 verses of the New Testament. In the New Testament, there are 23 books that refer to the second coming of Christ out of the 27 books in the New Testament. Now, this statistic just blew me away. In doing this homework, I found... Now, watch this. You have the first coming of Christ. You know about that. Bethlehem. Golgotha. Second coming of Christ. Jerusalem. All right, now go back. For every one prophecy of Christ coming the first time, there are eight prophecies of Christ coming the second time. Now, when I read that statistic, I have to tell you, I chuckled in my spirit. And here's why. I'm thinking, Jesus gives us these prophecies of his first coming... He actually comes, people see him, they write about him, he dies, rises again from the dead, people see the death in a sense and see the res- him after the resurrection, they all write about it. So wouldn't you know, if he said he was coming, he did come, people said it, hey man, why do I need eight times more for the second coming when the Lord's probably laughing in heaven? Wait a minute, you dummies, I did everything I said I was going to do here, why do you need eight times more? Because we're brass-headed and iron-necked people. Well, maybe I am and you're not, but we eight times more. Now, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but listen to this. Every single prophecy that was prophesied ahead of time telling us about Christ coming the first time, where he would come, when he would come, how he would die, where he would die, all of that, all of that, every prophecy of Christ has been fulfilled. But not every prophecy has been fulfilled for his second coming. Does anybody know why? He hadn't come yet. But when he comes, and by the way, there's different stages of him coming, they'll all be fulfilled. How do I know? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, his blood, and his righteousness. All right, let's talk about him coming now. He comes, and I call it three expressions of his coming. You got your Bibles? Let's look at them together here. So it says he came. He says, for this is to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. I'll talk about that in a moment. For the Lord himself will descend. That means he will return. He will come down from heaven with a what, everyone? With a what? With a what? Shout. He's going to come with a shout. Now, I have to tell you, a lot of people want to make a big deal over the shout thing. But in the Greek, it's not so much the word shout. It's more like the word command. He comes with a word. Now, that fits. Because if you'll find in Scripture, in John chapter 5, it talks about, verse 24 talks about, you need to believe on Jesus Christ so you won't be condemned and you'll have everlasting life. You've got to hear His voice, get saved. And then the next verse talks about, and if you hear His voice and you're dead, you will live. And you only hear His voice when you're dead and live because you placed your faith in Christ. So those two verses go together, actually the whole context. But it's hearing His voice or His command. Now this gets really cool. In the New Testament, there are two guys, Lazarus. All right, let's talk about the Lazarus who died. He was the brother of Mary and Martha. So you have brothers and two sisters that we know of in that little uh, triumphant. So Lazarus dies. He's dead not one day, not two days, not three days, but how many days? Four days. So he stinketh. And so everybody's all upset. And the Lord's crying too because not he lost his friend. He knew he was going to bring him back to life again. But he was crying because of the way the people were just so turned, just turned up. Um, Uh, upset over the death. And so what he does is he comes over here to the cemetery and he says what? Lazarus, come forth. So he gave a command. It would be like, and the shout. And he came forth. Now there's a difference between what happens to the believers when Jesus comes at the rapture. We're going to call it the second coming for right now. And what he did there. What he did with Lazarus, he did not resurrect Lazarus. He resuscitated Lazarus. How do I know that? Because Lazarus then later on, what did he do? He died. Okay. But when he comes for us, should we not be alive when he comes and we're dead, then what does he do for us? He resurrects us and it comes with a shout, with a command. One old wag said, I'm sure glad that when Jesus looked at the cemetery and he faced the tomb of Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he said, come forth, all the graves would have opened. I don't know if that's all true. But I know this is true. He did say Lazarus come forth. And guess what happened? Lazarus did. Let's look on. What's the second expression? The next one is very simple in the passage. 
It talks about an angel here. It says here, with the voice of an angel, of the archangel. Now, I don't have time to speak on angelology. We're teaching that right now on Wednesday nights. But come back to this. In the correct translation, it doesn't say... This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.